This episode is brought to you by the O2, the official recovery drink of the Noble CrossFit Games. For more information, you can use the QR code or you can click the link in the show notes below. Welcome back, everybody, to the best hour of your day. We got such tremendous feedback on part one with Chris Hinshaw, and I know you're going to love part two with Chris. So I know I told you last week was the last week, but affiliate owners, we've actually extended it. You have this week. This is the final week. We got so busy at the CrossFit Games. We know you guys were watching the CrossFit Games. We don't want you to miss out on this opportunity. So if you haven't already, if you're an affiliate owner, book that call with us. If you sign up for Affiliate University, you get a free level one or level two seminar. I don't have to tell you any more about that. Just know this is the final week. So if you still want to turn your affiliate into a world-class box, if you want to work with me and Fern and the team, if you want to see revenue go up, if you want to reignite that passion for CrossFit, now is the time because we have so much in the works for you. There's never been a better time to be an affiliate owner, and there's never been a better time to work with us at Affiliate U. Now, part one was amazing. Part two is just as good. This guy's the best storyteller out there. I can listen to Chris and shut talk all day. And I hope you've been enjoying it again. If you're listening to this podcast, please head over to our YouTube channel. We're really doing big things over there. We've got great content from the CrossFit Games coming at you. And we've got some other great things in the works. For those of you that don't necessarily own an affiliate, but you're a coach at an affiliate or even a member at an affiliate, you're going to want to subscribe because we've got some exclusive content coming to this YouTube channel for coaches and members. You want to be a better athlete. You want to be a better coach. You want to excel at CrossFit. You're going to want to stay tuned for what we've got here on the Best Hour of Their Day channel. All right, enough blabbering from me. I'm excited to present to you part two of our interview with Chris Henshaw. Welcome to the Best Hour of Their Day podcast with your hosts, Jason Fernandez. And me, Jason Ackerman. With more than 20 years in the business, as both coaches and affiliate owners, our passion is to help create world-class affiliates and coaches by building better boxes. boxes. Welcome to the best hour of your day. I don't want to miss out on like discussing the SME courses coming back. You have a new program that you just launched recently, um, correct? I think you just launched a, a new running program. Oh, I did. Or, I, okay. I, I saw- <laughs> Uh, I wanted to let you know you've launched a new he program. Was, he yeah, was yeah. back in the handstand competition. <laughs> he was just still upset about his mom. But and and I want to take ask, over the marketing department. You launched a new program. Before you go yeah, there, yeah. can I challenge you for something? <laughs> yeah. Going back to but we should talk about that pacing thing. So no, yeah, I yeah. want to talk about that before we do that. We've kind of beaten around the grace bush, right? And and you gave us some great drills to improve specifically there. Lay out an hour. Lay out a one hour class for me for the listeners where they get to incorporate everything you're talking about, but still hit the workout or maybe that is the workout, but what would from, from, you know, five minutes at the whiteboard brief, cool down at the end. How can somebody take this and, and, and make it a reality? So the first thing that I would start incorporating right away is those five minute workouts that we had mentioned mm-hmm. at the end, at the end, at so the make end. Sure so that's, five minutes. Devoted. That is when you, when people, and this is, we always go back. Like if you forfeit the cool down, you are forfeiting a massive amount of, of equity inside that class to get either change or community or whatever. It's, but it's about community right. too. But I love what you said. We, we think about the warm up. No one, when we think cool nobody's down, nobody's prioritizing like, the cool do, down. Do a pigeon, a forward bend, and, uh, and wipe your, yeah. and yeah, wipe your bars people. down. Yeah. So uh, let's just say that, that uh, like a, a, a classic, like a five minute workout, you can do, um, all right. So our five minute workout, what we're going to do is we're going to do Russian twists, um, weighted with the feet off the ground, and we're going to go 15 seconds maximum intensity, bouncing the plate from side to side, feet off the ground. At the end of the 15 seconds, you're going to drop the plate down, and you're just going and feet ray on the ground, so and you're hard. just going to go Don't rush and twist me. fingertips slowly from side to side Got for it. the remainder of that minute. So every minute on the minutes, 45 of high intensity with the plate, 45 of slow with recovery, five rounds. All right. That is a f- classic five minute, what we call lactate clearance workout mm-hmm. that's focusing also on stamina in the hip flexor. The beauty of a workout like that, it, by having the entire class together, is that you're not counting repetitions. You don't care you know, wh- what weight people have. Their job is to just create fatigue on the intensity side and then recover on the recovery side. Mm-hmm. 
Everybody will complain the same, and it gels the group together as a community. It is a beautiful way to end the class. Right, because we're not featuring the biggest and the baddest. What we're doing is you're all suffering. And so long as you're suffering in that 15 seconds, we're good. So this would be something like you could put it like a Pat Shirt used to refer to these as cookies. But like, let's say you have like a workout, I don't know, you could eight do- to 12 minutes, it had toast to bar in it. Yeah. And then we and then we close it with this kind of Russian twist, alternating 45 but on you could 45. But you could do a whole lot of other things. I mean, you can do, you could do, for example, you know, um, we can do like a strict press. Right. Um, with some kind of a plate, like a anything from a 25 to a 45 mm-hmm. for 10 to 15 seconds and then dropping it and then PVC recovery. Got it. So it's any combination. You're just thinking about creating fatigue in a movement mm-hmm. and then clearing fatigue using the same movement pattern, same muscle group, but changing the intent and calling it recovery. Right. When in fact, really what you're doing is you're building stamina. Right. So it, that would be an example of like we did... Diane, we had handstand push-ups and you gassed out. You're like, well, we're going to close this out with something like that, at least 10 pound plate and a PVC pipe. That might be a lot because you just had fatigued those. Like you can do something where it would be, um, let's say seven feet tuck jumps, you know, like ballistic jumps. Right. And then uh, the remainder of a minute, slow recovery air squats. Got it. Five rounds. Okay. So uh, you would do like that workout like Diane, you would, after you would do an active recovery in those movements. Right. That's what I guess that's Finish what I was out referring the bell to. Yeah, yeah, so the first thing I would do is those five minute type of a workout at the end to bring everybody together. That would be the easiest thing. And if you were smart as a coach, so long as the time domains were the same, you could write up on the board, here is upper body option core option, lower body option. And they're always five uh, minutes, every minute on the minute. It's always 12 seconds of intensity, the remainder recovery. Pick whatever one you want and you're just on the watch five minutes, it's over. I like that. And, 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 and every shooter's choice, everybody can pick whatever they want to work on. Right, but that, also... that's important. I'm sorry. So yeah. that, that is important though. I, I, one of the things that I notice all the time and I've been to a lot of gyms around the world, a lot. I mean, every course I teach, and one of the things that you notice right away is that, that it is the coach that's always telling directions. The athlete needs to take some ownership in this. And what you want is to pick, pick one of the threes. Now they own it. Mm-hmm. They picked it. You didn't pick it. You had three options. Same thing when you guys, when we were talking about the clean and, and grace, what is preventing you from getting better at grace? You are the one that said what it was. Mm-hmm. Does it really matter to me what you pick? It really doesn't matter. I just need you to pick. Mm -hmm. That way you own it. There's a difference of being passively involved versus actively involved. And I want every athlete I work with actively involved. They own it. My job is to maximize your adaptation in that most efficient way and to explain the purpose of these workouts so that when I hand it to you, your job is to execute it. Well, this is one more tool to layer into a class that would maximize retention. Just like Sweet. having, crush it. you crush it, just have having them bought into the class, not just showing up to be told what to do, but they're like, oh, I w- I'm actively, intentionally making a decision to do this portion of it. Yep, that's and, what, it, and you said it right. It's retention. Retention is the number one test, in my opinion, for an affiliate. Is agreed. If I went into a gym, the first thing I would ask is, tell me about your membership base. How long has the longest woman been here? Longest male, longest coach. I want to know your mom retention. Do a two minute yeah. handstand. <laughs> two minute handstand. If she can't, then I'm out. Yeah. No, and, and, and what I'm hearing also is accountability on coaches because you do, you know, we did that workout the other day. Some of us were done an eight, some 10, some 12. Now at the whiteboard, you better get better at providing a good stimulus because we're all finishing. And like you said, within two minutes, yep, right. I want everybody moving on yep. to the stamina slash you know, aerobic capacity piece. So I need to be better at presenting this workout to know everyone finishes within that little window so we can move on together. Yep. So the other thing that you could do is if my recommendation is every athlete in, in every gym should understand their physiology. What What is their strengths, what are their weaknesses? And so, you know, we were talking about this, this coefficient of slowing, this mm-hmm. fatigue factor formula. 6%. You know, so in the movement of running, I, early on, because no one would talk to me, I had to take conventional numbers. And what I did is I took a 400 because it's an anaerobic time domain. Mm-hmm. So in, you know, a, you know, a 400 around the track, it's mostly anaerobic, you know, without oxygen, glycolytic pathway, right. fast twitch. 
I compare it with a mile because it's mostly slow twitch aerobic. And I look at the rates of fatigue between the distance and the times that an individual performs. And I look at the slope between those lines. And the average, after doing some 20 some odd thousand CrossFit athletes mm -hmm. in those two time domains, I realize the rate of fatigue isn't 6%, it's 21 to 22%. So if we take Rich Froning, Rich Froning had a 400 of 60 seconds in the beginning and a mile time of six minutes. His coefficient of slowing was 28.7%. So that means that he slowed from 400 to roughly 800 meters, 28.7%, and then he slowed another 28.7 from 800 to a mile. Well, the reason why he walked in triple three is because you keep moving him into longer time domains. Right. He's going to walk. He's got no option. 28% right. yeah. compounding, right? Right. And so if you have a high percentage, meaning your goal is to be between 21 and 22, and he's at 20, almost 29, Dan Bailey's at 35. So... Imagine who's going to walk first. It will, and Jason Kalipa was 25.6. So who would walk first out of those three people? Dan would. Dan would, yeah. Of course. And so what it does is it tells you your weakness, meaning those three needed endurance, but it also t tells you the magnitude of the weakness, mm -hmm. meaning Dan Bailey should do way more aerobic-based, slow, long-time domain training than Rich, but Rich should do more than Jason. Mm -hmm. The frequency should go up. So imagine if you have a tool that can do an assessment and imagine if that tool not only tells you what your weakness is and the magnitude of it, but like it will tell Rich, oh, by the way, based upon 20 some odd thousand CrossFit athletes, you should be able to run a 525 mile. Right. So that's what I've done. Um, you know, one of the things that we could do afterwards is I can make that available to your group. It's a Google Doc, and they just yeah, save sure. it. And, yeah, that'd be amazing. And then one of the things but that— But you have that in your, on your, in your programs, in your online app, I do. Correct? But, but, yeah. if, but, I mean, what we could do is we can make it available to your viewers and— Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Young I think— Katie. Young Katie will post it in the link. We'll get yeah. it. So same thing holds true for rowing. So rowing, it's different. Rowing, the rate of fatigue, uh, the one I'll give you if you want the one in rowing, it's one minute and six minutes. I like it based upon time. For because, what distance on that? So it's one minute one and minute six minutes. One minute instead of distances is time okay. for the rowers. So the reason why I don't like Keep up. The reason why I did 400 in a mile is because no one would talk to me. The problem is, is if you and I run a mile, we're going to be done in different times. Meaning, let's say that it takes you four minutes and it takes me six minutes. That's not the same. But if you run max effort for six minutes and I go six minutes, now that's a relative intensity. Wow. So when I looked at rowing and starting it, I'm like, the way to do it is a one minute and a six minute. That way, everybody is doing the same exact test. And so in like rowing, that. because your body weight is supported by the rower, the bigger athlete isn't punished like running. The rates right. of fatigue aren't as high. So in running, the rate of fatigue really between that, you know, that 400 and that mile, or we can say one minute and six minutes for Rich. Well, Rich's rate of fatigue between one minute and six minutes in the rower is about nine and a half percent. Average for our population is between nine and a half and 10. And it's also why they have weight classes in rowing. I mean, the weight, it makes a difference mm -hmm. when you have to support it. Right. And rowing you have the benefit of it supported by the object. So yeah, we could do that one too. And, and um, this would be a quick assessment tool for people to plug in and just see where they sit. And it will say that here's the magnitude of the weakness and here's what you should focus your time on. No one, you know, you go to a lot of gyms, they have the kind of perceived one rep maxes. Yeah, yeah so you, you have your chart, your your. No one's theory. done this for running and rowing. You should no. put it out there. Well, I mean, that's another thing is like you see about these conversion tables and and it's always interesting. People say, oh, 400 run, it converts to a 500 row. No. If I have you run for two minutes and your running time domain was, uh, you know, two minutes for 400 meters, then I would have you row at that same relative intensity for two minutes. Two minutes and see what the distance right. is. Right, yeah. because it's about time. Right. It's not, you can't, you got to be really careful. That's those definitely conversions. something that we, uh, we've started to stress more and more over the years is when it comes to the monostructural stuff, a lot of people just have like blanket numbers they throw up there. And I'm, I'm like, well, no, let's have, let's put a little more thought into this. Like what time wise, where should they be? It's not about that. Forget 400. It could be 250. Who knows? But like re relative time domain, that's you, what we're shooting for. Not the distance. Do you find you lose people when you say that? Like, Hey, you know, let's talk about this. Like some just want 
the answer. And then there's others that they want to know because, and those are the exceptions, meaning those are the gyms that are the great ones. Right. That they're really diving in and going, I get it. I think... I think it depends, right? And I think the I think the answer to this is as a coach, recognizing who you're talking to. So rec- having having that knowledge and recognizing some people just want to be fed the answer. The other people want to like, why are you changing this? And I really want to know like why I'm going to have that. But that's that's incumbent on me yeah. to a have the information and then b be able to read the athlete. So that going back to what you were talking about is like guide them regardless of which one I'm talking about. So yeah. I've got this one who just wants the answer fed to them. I've got this one who really is maybe not going to challenge me, but wants to know what's the why behind this? Why are you changing this? Because, you know, they're the, typically the ones that would be compatible. Like, I don't want you to change that. No, we're changing it for a reason. We're right. changing it for a, an intentional, intelligent reason. And here's what the outcome is going to be. So I think my answer would be, it depends on presentation. It depends on how you present that information. Because yeah. I would be, you'd be hard pressed to convince me that if you walked into the, an affiliate and presented some a random athlete with that information and you would probably communicate the why behind it at which point they'd be like yep i'm totally on board but if i just hit you with a nope i'm just chopping your rounds down because you're going to be too slow that's not going to be received very well yeah right right Right. now that you're back in the specialty seminar circuit sme circuit yeah kind of cool has anything changed in the the course or is it just gone from what you were doing because you were an sme originally right and then they, well, I wasn't originally, I don't, I was He wasn't. Not, and then he was, I was and then yeah. he did away like, with it. Yeah. Yeah. I was a bad boy for a while. And then somehow uh, I, so I, I worked, I, so I had a full-time job in 2015 full-time and uh, like a high job in Silicon Valley. And um, I was programming workouts weekly for 55 athletes that went to the games on top of a real career. So I quit a week before that. The problem was, is that I did everything in CrossFit for free for the first three years. Um, and, I, you know, what's interesting is I got that advice from Coach Glassman. Uh, I've known Glassman for a long time, since, you know, early 2000. And, and one of the things that, that we talked about was the fact that he put .com workouts out there for free. And he said that it validated the methodology. Like people didn't come by the, you know, the hundreds, they came by the tens of thousands. Mm-hmm. And so what it did was it compressed his learning curve. Well, after 2013, I could have, you know, charged people to coach them, but that wasn't my intent. I had a full-time job. What my intent was, can we turn this into a, a proven methodology, mm-hmm. not just by three athletes, but by thousands? Do what Glassman did. And how am I going to do that? And so what I did is I said, I'm going to coach anybody and everybody for free. And I did it for free for three years. And so when I quit my job, I was in sales for 25 years in the Valley. Um, I went from making a lot of money to zero money. And um, yeah, that was, a, that was a, a difficult time. But because I had worked with so many people and doing what Glassman said, I had a good sound understanding of, of what needed to be done. I mean, by then I've been working... I mean, you know, I'd work, I was working with Fraser and Froning and Camille and Katrin. I mean, there was countless. Well, people. you had gotten your reps in, you had mm-hmm. proven value, and you had given away a ton of information. So a, a at that point, yeah, it's kind of the same thing we do with the podcast. But at, at that point, at, at which point you do go and sell something, nobody's, nobody's going to bat an eye at it. They're like, yes, I'll, I will happily take that. Well... Yeah, it, 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 there was nothing for me to sell then. And so, you know, when, when I got started in the seminars, it was, I'll never forget, I was at San Jose at a regionals. Um, and Matt Chan, who I, I got to know back in 2013 and still very friendly with today, we do a bunch of stuff with fire. Um, and he said to me, he says, hey, I want to, you know, go out to dinner. And so I met him over in Santa Cruz and we sat down at dinner and, and he's all, can you just explain what you do? I'm just curious because he was doing the competitor course and mm-hmm. he was on seminar staff, his wife, you know, Sheree, Sheree. was right. So she was on staff flow master. Mm-hmm. And so I'm all sure. Yeah, no. And so I outlined it. Well, he's writing these notes and he's got like, he's working these six cocktail napkins. And by the time dinner is done, he flips them all around. He's all, this is a full day course. You got to share this with the world. You have to. And he told me one piece of advice. He says, Chris, but when you decide, you do this, you share everything. You share your algorithm, you share your assessment tools, the fatigue factor information, you share everything. 
And the only thing I don't share is athletes' results. You know, those are their own private yeah. things. Um, and so I'm like, I don't know. I'm not ready. I'm not ready. This was in 20, you know, April of 20, no, June of 2014 ish. Uh, that was on a Saturday. On the Tuesday, he calls me in Denver. He was in Denver and he calls me and says, Hey, so um, thought about that seminar? And I'm like, No, not at all. And he's all, I have. And I'm like, Oh, really? And he's all, Yeah, no, I've. I booked you here at Verve. He owned CrossFit Verve. He yeah. said, I booked I sold you 25 here. slots already. He's all, no, I sold three. And I'm like, you sold three slots? And I'm all, how long? He's all, a full day. You're doing eight hours this Saturday. I'm all, this Saturday, like in four days Saturday? He's all, yep. And so I flew out there. And man, that was a, you know, the first seminar you do, and you do it like that, I was, I took a, a break at lunch and I went out in my car and I was going to go get food and I Smoked went around the cigarette. <laughs> I took a nap. I took a nap. I mean, I was destroyed, but you know, I did that course and, and, um, I, I happened to be in, in Boulder, Colorado, um, New Year's Eve. And, you know, I, I spent a bunch of time with Nicole Carroll and just as a friend and, and, I, I paid for the trip to go out and I was staying with Dave Lipsum and Camille and, and of course, Matt and Cherie lived there too, mm -hmm. right? They're really, they were neighbors and um, went out there and just doing snowshoe and hang out with them. But to pay for the trip for my wife and I, we put a seminar on at Roots and um, um, uh, Nicole Carroll came and uh, I'll never forget it because right, uh, she sat in the back of the class and I've always known Nicole as just a friend. I don't know her as, as you know, head. Our boss. Right. Yeah. I don't, right. Our, our boss. The person listening to this is debating if she's going to fire us. And so I was like, I, I saw her in the back and just writing all the time. No, the whole time. At the end, I finish just one day course. She comes around to the front right when I was done, right to me. And she's like, that was one of the best courses I've ever attended. I mean, and it was so complimentary and That's so positive. Compliment. Uh -huh. Yeah, and, and it wasn't until then that I realized there was value. It was just at that moment, it was just passion. These are the things that I like. This is what I enjoy. This is what I know. And she didn't talk about that. What she talked about was the delivery, the passion I have, the, the inflection, how I coach, how I do it, the mannerisms. And those things are all just natural, but that's mm -hmm. what she saw. And so she said to me, she says, you know, if you submit, um, I'll, I'll approve CEUs for this, you know, right away. He's, she says, I really want this part of what we're doing, which was super cool because up until that moment, I was not always in the good graces because I was, I was saying things that were, I don't want to say contradictory to CrossFit. It's just that CrossFit wasn't yet saying them. Right. Like, like for example, we always say that your job is to get as much work done in the least amount of time. Well, in order to do that, you have to maximize the consumption of your available energy, meaning you have to pace it. Mm -hmm. You can't just go out hot and hope you hang on. Well, pacing wasn't as, as, as well received as it is today. Oh, I mean, it just flat out wasn't a thing back in the day. Right. <laughs> Crash and burn. It was just Crash full send. Burn, yeah. uh, should I slow down here? No, you should just send it. Yeah. So um, it changed. And then the same thing with doing intervals. Like it's interesting how pacing well, is talked about. Intervals are now part of workouts. Well, that's where I was going to go with that is I think there was just a, there wasn't a comprehension around how slowing down would allow you to speed up, right? right? So like slowing down playing around with threshold, playing around with recovery, what would that actually yield when it is, to, when it is time to lay the hammer down? And then people were just like, well, the fastest way to do that is just go hard, go hard, go hard, rinse, repeat. And like, you do need to do that, but it needs to be balanced. Like you started with this, it needs to be balanced or tempered with this idea of like, well, I need to figure out how to maximize my recovery. And again, I think most people think of recovery as like after the workout. And a lot of what you're referring to is like in the midst of the workout recovery, like between reps, when I'm transitioning, like as I'm working, do, doing this work. Do a five by five back squat and do a 500 meter row during your three to four minutes of rest. And you know what you're going to get is you'll get your five by five back squat in and you'll get in 2,500 meters of rowing at that aerobic recovery pace. Mm -hmm. That's what you'll get. You're getting more work done in the same amount of time. You just have to reframe it. Right. So, it's not for time. Right. What right. I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a workout. It's seven rounds, and you're going to do seven. We were talking about clean and jerk. Uh, you're going to do seven heavy clean and jerks. And then what I want you to do is I want you to go from out the building. 
I want you to go to that stop sign there, and I, you can go as slow as you want. I just don't want any walking. And when you come back into the gym, you must pick up that barbell right away. Mm-hmm. And you're doing seven rounds. But if you drop that bar in any of the seven rounds, you're starting over again. Got it. And you know what you're going to do is you're going to get them focusing on the lift when, in fact, the purpose of the workout is to have them run down to the stop sign and back. And that down and back may take five minutes. And you do seven rounds. You just got that person to run for 35, 40 minutes at an easy pace because they were focused on the lift. Mm -hmm. You reframe it. I call those workouts like we were talking about high intensity effort for, you know, 10 to 15 seconds and then an active recovery, right? I'm calling it recovery when in fact it's really not recovery. Mm-hmm. I'm just framing it that way. These are not the droids you're looking for. It's, well, it's like, it's like putting vegetables in the meatloaf for the kids. It's right. blending kale right. in yeah. your smoothie. Yeah. yeah. That's, That's what, what you're doing. You right this there? is healthy right here. <laughs> there you go. And, and what's cool that you've said to, uh, especially about when Nicole brought you on and you were saying, hey, I was kind of counter to what they're suggesting. We end every what is fitness lecture at level ones is, hey, we're evidence-based. Yep. You know, Show us how you've gotten better, and that's what they did. They adapted that. that. That's what really made me feel, because I love the sport. I love what it has done for my own health. And, I mean, as you get older, I mean, health is in the top three. You know, your Mm -hmm. family and friends and your health. I mean, that's it. And the sport of triathlons left me just broken. And you watch me move now. I'm 58 years old, and I can move. And the only thing that I did was CrossFit. And so because of that, I was grateful. And when... The things I was doing were were misunderstood. I don't want to say they weren't well received, but they were misunderstood. It hurt because it it was something that that I I knew provided value. Mm -hmm. It's just that they didn't understand yet. And it was really nice when, you know, it's it's interesting is is I I heard from, uh, it was Nicole that reached out uh, in 2016 and she says, you know, we really like what you're doing with your seminar and we would like to, to fold it into um, CrossFit community. And would you be interested in becoming a subject matter expert? And the thing that what really makes you feel is, is that the journey, it was done not because of that as a goal. It wasn't about that. I, I believed in what I was doing and I didn't change my intent because other people's opinions. I stayed true to what I believed and I kept it authentic. And one of the things that, that with this course that made it, I think, so successful is that the sport of CrossFit has evolved from year over year over year. One of the things that I was not allowed to do with CrossFit in that initial agreement was make changes to my content. And I changed it every single seminar mm-hmm. because the sport changed it. And I look back on that, it would have been better to have a level one, a level two, and then a level three. But the truth is, is that now this course, it is gold. It is, if, if there is, if I look at the things that, that I teach, would I want to teach anything else? Is there anything of higher value? And the answer is no. The content in that course is so empowering that people leave it and it's like, they walk out and they're confident. They're confident that they say, you know what? I put a lot of money into these other seminars. I put a lot of money into my education. I put a lot of money into my programming, but I don't feel confident anymore. I feel like I'm stale. I feel like I've lost options. I've lost direction. I don't know what to do. This course, it puts it all together and gives you direction, but it's empowering. People forget what they already know. And what I do is make the, the not so obvious, obvious. Mm-hmm. Like when we were talking about grace. Right. You just get tired. So what's that tour look like? Do you, have, do you already have some stuff lined up for that? Hey guys, Nicole Christensen here with Dave Kalina, founder of O2. So I own Crossfit Roots in Boulder, Colorado, and over the years we've had a vetting process for anything that we're going to carry in our store, and and really our guiding principle has been, I never wanted any of our members to have to say no to something every day that they walked by, like have to resist the urge for like, I'm carrying a paleo brownie or something like that. So there were things that we were just never going to carry, like we're never going to carry monster energy and have people say no to that every time. But O2 is definitely different. So. 
One of the th reasons is that it's it's a pure drink. It's it's natural. It doesn't have sugar. Very one gram of sugar. So Dave, talk to us a little bit about O2. I mean, that was great. And, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and then also about the deal with Best Hour. Yeah. So so the easiest way to think about O2 is a cleaner, healthier sports drink. Yes. And so, like Nicole said, it's only got one gram of sugar per can, uh, 15 calories total, and no artificial ingredients. So there's nothing you can't pronounce on the side of the label. Um, everything's non-GMO approved, which we're really proud of. And it's in a can because single-use plastic sucks. And so that's O2 in a nutshell. It's also twice as efficacious as Gatorade. So we have twice the electrolytes as Gatorade, but again, only one gram of sugar. So better for you, healthier, and I know I'm biased, but I think it tastes awesome. So too. you can have electrolytes without sugar. Totally. Shocking. Totally. Shocking. Imagine that, right? <laughs> Check it out, guys. Yeah, so we launched, we were saving. So this conversation of rolling back into, you know, the SME program, it it, mm -hmm. it started at the games. And so... It's almost a year ago. Yeah. yeah. So... Yeah, but, I mean, we got wind of it before it was announced, but I know I knew it had been in the works for a while. Yeah, part of the, they wanted to recognize, this is the difference also, you know, there's a lot of changes in HQ. And, you know, a lot of people, because we're relatively close, you get asked questions of things and... The thing what I tell people is they're very thorough now. They're very receptive and they're engaging. It used to be one way and now it's the other side. Like one of the things that, that you know, we talked about, I mean, that I talk about is our rate. So our seminar is, is $349 for the whole day. But in Brazil, 349 that exchange rate, because of the devaluation of their currency, you know, it's 20% of what it used to be. Right. It's a lot of money. They can't pay that amount. Right. Well, historically, too bad. It's 349. Mm -hmm. If people don't go, well, it's like, then I'm not going to travel there. Mm -hmm. That's not the way it is now. Yeah. They're receptive. And that's what I like. They're, it's a relationship versus this is the way it's going to be. And yeah, we'll listen to you, but we're not going to you know, put any of those things into action. The difference now is they want to hear from you because they want to serve the community. Mm -hmm. And what's the best way to serve it? So another example is, is that they said, we want you to teach 50 courses. That's a lot. That's a lot That's of courses. Aggressive. For me, there's no way. <laughs> that escalated quickly. <laughs> <laughs> there's no way. In, one, in a calendar year. Yeah. So okay. there's just, there's no way. I mean, That's a lot. Well, and are you trying not to, a lot of specialty courses have brought on a staff. Are you trying to maintain just you being there? Well, I, so... I really like teaching the course. I really, really enjoy it. It, it doesn't feel like work. Uh, but what, the reason why I like doing it is because I get to see what's happening in our community. It, it gives me insights into the direction around the world. Mm -hmm. So you can scale things based upon that. You know, like Italy. Like I spend a lot of time in Italy. You were there 10 years ago. I saw your post with your wife on the yep. uh, canal. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was amazing. What's your, what's your go-to in Italy? What do you go for? What do I Fettuccine do? Alfredo? <laughs> is that what it is? No? Lots of wine. <laughs> what's, yeah, some Prosecco. Did you, yeah. Were you a carb guy before your, oh, like always. my father? Oh, yeah. And always. now that, would you still do that? Oh, yeah. You would load up on, you would still carb load before a, I mean, I, an endurance belt? I would do it if it was like a Sunday dinner. doesn't matter. Oh, you just like carbs. You wear <laughs> yeah. the same base. It's, 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 it's nothing thing. to do with training. Okay. It's just, like, just, because, just because it's fun. No, I feel like that was like an old <laughs> no. fallacy that's not quite as um, recognizable anymore. I, no, I just like my carbs. I mean, I <laughs> yeah, think okay. that, yeah. No, I, I told Fern, you know, it's going to be 5'3", 160 without liking a few carbs here and there. <laughs> there you go. No, so I, I, I like teaching the course. I really do. I like the things that um, you learn along the way. The problem is, is that 50 is not a reasonable, it's, it's, it's not a, a possible. Right. I also want to add in, you know, level two and, okay. and do higher end content. And, and that would so, be, would that be more uh, structured toward like coaches, like coaching, coaching other athletes? Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. So that's, that's where I, the, I love hearing that. Cause that's where I think a lot of people really want to dive in. Like they go to the yeah. course and like, this is amazing. Practically speaking, I'm still trying to wrap my brain around. How do I, how do I take this information and then take that and give it to my athletes? So I went through business school, um, finance and that's how we learned was case studies. Mm -hmm. So we learned by reading a case study and then providing a recommendation. And so 
I thought that why not take an elite level athlete and present a situation and and put it out there in advance mm. before the course where people have to come in prepared. Mm. What is your recommendations? What's your protocols? What's your ideas? And it's not me saying, hey, this is the best way. There's right. many best ways. And I want to be receptive to other people's ideas because I learn from other coaches, right. other athletes and research, right? This is a way for me also to learn. And so selfishly, I want to do it in a way where I'm presenting you know, six case studies as part of it, and then they're going to come in and pitch, kind of like what you do in the level two, yeah. but not in terms of coaching and demonstration. It's in terms of programming. Right. The old school level two had that. I took it back with Nicole at Santa Cruz, and day two, you had to lay out the zone for an athlete. Yeah. So it's, it's funny you say that because it's very reminiscent of what the old school level two was like. You showed up, you were given this type of person, body type, weight, and then a zone prescription. I mean, yeah. not quite as extensive as what you're describing, but still really cool because it's that practical application that gets your coaches better at presenting it to the class. Right. Well, and a lot of coaches, they're not sure how to... So let's say that you're a speed athlete, strength, power, and you're an endurance athlete, but you're both members of my gym. Mm -hmm. Well, if you know that, I could write a workout and let's just say that we're going to do rowing today. All right, the workout's going to be six rounds and we're going to do a combination of 30 seconds and three minutes. All right. So since you're a speed athlete, you're going to do three minutes at a moderate pace. You get 30 seconds of rest, six rounds. You're going to do the opposite. You're an endurance athlete. I'm going to make you sprint for 30 seconds and then you get three minutes of recovery. And this Same is a, time domain, but it's separating it based upon what they need. And the beauty of that is having that information, having that knowledge, and then becoming a practitioner in that, the, the value added in a group class setting by making subtle adjustments like that could not possibly be overstated. Well, because it's about, it goes back to retention. Right. And, and if you are able to, everybody wants personalization. No one wants to pay for it. So this is a form of personalization because what we're doing is targeting the highest value of your time. Absolutely. Right. And that starts with an understanding of who you are. Well, I mean, let's just talk about that. So, I mean, if you just do the simple math on it, it's just like, hey, I'm going to try to sell programs and maybe you sell some, maybe you don't like inside the walls of your facility. Or what if you could just keep people for five years? Which one of those financial, right. which one of those financial options would you like? Would you like to sell an eight week program or do you want people to stay for 60 months? The other thing right. I heard about right. that is you don't have enough rowers for everybody in your class. No big deal. Hey, if you're a 30 second athlete, find a 30, a three right. minute athlete. Right. Now alternate. we've doubled, you know, or multiple people yeah. that do 30 seconds, hop on the seat. Right. If it's six people, Dude. if you're doing 30 second intervals in three minutes. And this is easy. This is efficient from a, from a lesson planning standpoint. This starts to unfold very nicely. Yep. Yeah. It's just looking and reframing it in a different way. And every coach, if you hear that sound bite, you're like, wow, yeah, why can't I do a workout that's five by five and throw in a 500 meter easy row in three minutes? Why not? Yeah. yeah. It's, and, it, and once you understand the logic behind it, it's like, that's pretty good. And it's, that's a great heavy day. Right. Because how many times do we hear, oh, heavy days are this or that? Right. Well, you're, A, you're not playing 80s rock, which makes every heavy day better. Right. We can, also, agree, to, we can it, agree to that, right, Chris? 100%. That's true. Yep, also, that. also, with regard to that, you're talking about <laughs> making sure that people are getting the appropriate amount of rest between sets. Well, now it's fixed. That's already decided right. for you. Like, I you love cannot that. get off any more than any, any right. faster than three minutes. I love that clean exercise because when as you were saying, I'm like, man, you're going to get people – hook gripping the hell out of that bar and not letting go for seven reps. They're adding in, you know, a mile, two miles of running somewhere in there and then picking up that bar again, right? Like they're dictating the time, but based on their speed and now they're going to hook grip it again. And like, that's a great way to have a fantastic workout. Right. You should really consider putting this into a seminar. <laughs> if you haven't, I'll help you sit down. We'll sit down. <laughs> All right. Thank, thank you. I don't know. Matt, Matt's thank a you. smart dude. Did you, did you help him with the Titan games? Uh, no, 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 no. That was all him. No, Matt and I do a lot of stuff now. So I've, I've really spent a lot of time with first responders and military. Um, you know, I've done a lot of work with the fire department in New York. Uh, I've done you're saying North you're going Metro there in, in June, June and August. Yeah. So I, I, um, one of the things that, that in fire is really interesting is, is, you know, heart attacks, cardiorespiratory disease being the number one killer for the last almost 20 years and and 
to me, it's, it's because a lot of times people don't know where to start. They don't know where to go. Like there's so much information out there. Like if you've lost your fitness and you're 40 years old, what should you do? And unfortunately, you, what you will read out there is high intensity interval work. You know what the best way to get fit is 2010 Tabata and you're going to do eight rounds. Well, if you're out of shape, you're like, oh. that's That's such a significant hurdle to get over if you've not been training and you're completely out of shape. Like you're just, right. you're not showing, you're going to try that once. You're like, this is dumb. I'm not doing this anymore. Right. Well, the problem is, is that you're, but you don't know where to go. And right. so that's where I, I've decided with first responders that if they are already working, meaning if you're a firefighter and you're in a firehouse, so not in the academy, I'll give you programming for free. Wow. So we probably, I'm sure have a lot of people. Yeah. There. That's for firefighters exclusively? Firefighters. And so, yeah, we could even put a link in there as well. So yep. it's it's a free program. And if, what it will do is it will personalize a workout for you as well. So most firefighters, they even have to do a 12-minute Cooper test mm -hmm. um, and max meters uh, to get their VO2 annual, or they'll have to do a mile and a half. And if they have either one of those scores, they could plug in uh, into this calculator their distance and their time, and it will populate all of their speeds. And what the purpose of this is, is to get people to be able to move for 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. So it starts out with just jogging and walking, and it ultimately ends up with two uh, intervals, 15 minutes of running at an easy speed with a 15-second walk um, as your rest. And what you're doing is you're just gradually allowing them to progress at their own speed. They could skip to find more difficult workouts, but if you can build foundation, the base to get someone to go 30 minutes, now you can add on your intensity. Unless your structure, your bones, your ligaments, your tendons are sound, yes, I agree that the high intensity is gonna create adaptation and you'll see it right away. That's why it has good value. For anybody, you see it. The problem is, is it's not sustainable. You right. ultimately will always have to build your foundation. Yeah. The problem is, is that people are switching those. Why? Because it's shorter time. But you know what? You're still going to have to go back and do this. It's, it's efficient in the context of one day. It's not, nece it's not necessarily always efficient in the context of like, how am I getting the biggest bang for this, this journey, right? Like, That's right. Because I'm going to have to circle back and, and, and kind of recoup some of that time or some of the things that I skipped. And I was talking to uh, Joe Alexander about this not too long ago and just – the general conversation He's was smart, man. He's very God, Joe's he just amazing, makes yeah. me feel like so stupid. Like what he did for Matt Chan in twenty what twelve? Oh yeah. I mean, he's, he's incredible. Yeah. Smart. He's, yeah. He's, uh, he no, always like, makes me feel stupid, yeah, um, smart. but he not on purpose just cause he's so smart. Yeah. He's smart. <laughs> but what he and I were talking about was saying like, well, bring people in the end of the field. Like how many of them would, would be better off spending a significant amount of time and call it four to 12 weeks potentially just working on their base of cardiorespiratory right. endurance before we ever actually dip our toe in the intensity bucket, like right. just give them the base and now you can ramp up right. the intensity portion enjoy, significantly faster. Right. Enjoy being out of shape. Right. Because it's not it, sexy. It's not sexy right. like doing But it cross. doesn't hurt. I mean, right. the right. difference is, is like, why suffer now? Enjoy this easy. Right. So what people <laughs> need to realize is a lot of people will ask me, like, I don't understand the purpose. Why build the base? Why that foundation? Like, why is it important? Why would I have to come back to it? Because people think, oh, I could just bypass that and jump ahead. Oh, I'm an old athlete. You know, uh, you know I've been around. I don't need to do that foundational work. Okay, here's the problem. We talked about that lactate threshold, that maximum sustainable pace. Mm -hmm. Think of that, at that maximum sustainable pace as the balance between your high intensity anaerobic creating lactic acid and your base is your aerobic slow twitch, clear fatigue. So your sustainable pace sits in the middle there. It's a relationship between fatigue coming in, right? Your high intensity, mm -hmm. speed, and your recovery, clearing. What is preventing your maximum sustainable speed from improving, from going up? Is it, do you need more intensity or is it your recovery? Mm -hmm. And in your clean grace, you said it was my recovery, mm -hmm. meaning, you need to focus on this. And if you focus on this, your sustainable speed will go up. go up. It is a relationship. And so a lot of people don't realize where is the most value in terms of intensity. Mm -hmm. It's your maximum sustainable pace. That's your number one. Right. And so in order to even focus on it, you have to have your solid foundation. And after that, you build your ceiling, 
Right. Now you have your base and your ceiling, and now for the rest of your life, you could raise this number. But you always must maintain high intensity. As soon as you stop, this will fall and it will put downward pressure on your sustainable and your base. So you build your base, you now have a huge platform, you then do your high intensity work, build your VO2 max, and now your sustainable pace floats in between there. And every movement has a different sustainable pace mm -hmm. and it's either limited by your intensity, your VO2, your ability to move right. and utilize oxygen, or your recovery. Right. That's what it is. And so you cannot just skip it. If you do, your lactate threshold number will be low because you just can't shove more intensity in. It's not gonna work. No, yeah. I mean, that's why when you talk about it, it's a simple way. It's like, you know, think about your movement of push-ups, And if you wanna do 10 more, what's preventing you from doing 10 more? Well, you can't just shove more in, can you? Yeah. You eventually tap. Well, why? Because you just get tired. Right. Or you just lack strength. It's either strength or I just get tired right. is preventing this. So think of about like an Everest in death zone. You yep. know, it's death zone is 26,000 feet. The peak is 29,000 feet. You got base camp. So we need to make sure that your peak is high. Mm -hmm. The higher up your peak goes, the more that you can actually bring up your sustainable pace. The bait, yeah, yeah. Okay. Right, your sustainable speed, your death zone. Right. So imagine on Everest, you now die above 26,000 feet, there's insufficient oxygen above that 26,000. Well, imagine if you, through practice and time at that lactate threshold or that death zone intensity, you could raise it from 26,000 to 27,000 feet. That means that there's insufficient oxygen for you at 27,000 feet, not 26. Right. That means you're still gonna hurt equally as bad, it's just that you're going now much faster. Right. That's all that's happening. So people always ask me, is running ever get easy? No, it always hurts the same amount. You're just faster. <laughs> You're just faster. That's what we say about CrossFit yeah. too. This right. doesn't France. get easier. It never gets right? easier. Right. You just like get just better. Hurts. It just like, hurts more. Right, like any of your you know, named events, you know. get faster, it still hurts the same. Yeah. Worse in, in, for many of them. Have you had other uh, modalities, mixed martial artists reach out to you ever? Because I feel like a lot of what you're saying, like I'm envisioning you're, you got a rear naked choke. Yeah. And for most people, Especially white belts, they'll just squeeze the hell out of it and blow up. Yep. No, Black done... belts will be like slow and controlled, but I'm thinking, like, well, if you work that. I have. So I had a guy, I'll tell you something. So this was a really amazing call. So yesterday, I had a guy that's a professional poker player online, calls me up. And it, this guy was brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. It's like and my fingers are getting tired. It's like I'm sitting no. too long. <laughs> because his, if you think about, they do, you know, when online poker, they'll do, you know, five to six hours. Oh, they do extended. Two days period. on, yeah, yeah. one day off. So the, we all know that mental fatigue is a part of that sport. Well, we also know that aerobic fitness improves your mental, you mm, know, fatigue. And can you write a prescription to improve your mental acuity in longer time domains. Well, of course you can. I mean, and it goes back to CrossFit. I think, you know, when we say about long time domains, yeah, we, we did a marathon row, but is that really long? I mean, I don't think I had- Relative, who are we talking about? Well, I don't think I had training days that were ever that short for eight years. I mean, <laughs> like, I, I, I mean, eight years I trained every day longer than that. I mean, I don't, I mean, for a, a, a breakfast conversation, a friend of mine and I, we rode a thousand, we decided to ride a thousand miles down the coast of California and we did it in four days. That was a breakfast conversation and it wasn't enough fitness. I actually tied my running shoes to my bike so I can go for a run after the 250 mile ride that day. That's a long day. A marathon row is not a long day. And so when these poker players, you know, they're playing, it's six hours and being sharp, aware, alert, that is a smart person. And you know what? That aerobic fitness will help an individual like that. Mm -hmm. Same thing, jujitsu. I do work with a lot of jujitsu. And one of the things that jujitsu um, fighters, they, they don't realize is that how much of their time is standing. Because they'll always say, oh, I can recover if I need to. I can get in a prone position. I can recover there. Yeah, but if 40% of your time is standing, yet you can't make it a lap around the track, that's a problem. Right. And, and so, and you also don't have complete control over what you're doing. Yes, if you you're don't. standing or not. Yeah. And so, what I really believe that what CrossFit coaches are is experts in movement. 
So if you take firefighting, and this is why I've been successful in the space, I looked at the, the, the movements of the job. And so take, take a body drag, take a hose, uh, mm -hmm. hose right? Any, any type of a movement, we can create a dry land protocol right. around that, and we can do it in two different ways. Is it your strength in that that's limiting you, or is it your fatigue? And so that's what we are. I think that CrossFit coaches are really the keys to the future in terms of, of fitness. One, it's, it's obviously the CrossFit community represents the 99.9% .9 of the population that's never going to the Olympics, right? Mm -hmm. They love fitness, but they weren't born that way. But we're finding out that they're the healthiest and most fit population in the world as well because they're spanning the edges of the endurance mm -hmm. spectrum as well as the strength spectrum, right? But that's where I, I feel that what CrossFit coaches can do is appeal to professions and other sports. Surfers, you know, I went North Shore. Mm -hmm. Surfers, number one injury, torn ACL. Why? Because when they get up on a wave and the chop and they're like this and they'll pop their ACL, well, do they do any leg training? No, of course not, because they think it's all upper bottle paddling. Right. But think about the transfer of lactic acid as you're paddling out into a lineup and the accumulation of that acidity in those muscle groups and it's spilling into the bloodstream. When it hits the bloodstream, it goes to the largest muscle group in the body, the legs. Imagine the legs are pre-fatigued when they go to stand and they thought they were not. Right. right. Why don't they go out there and practice boogie boarding with some fins and build the capacity of their legs so that the legs can help clear upper body fatigue and limit the amount of, of risk of a blown ACL. And put that into practice. They paddle. What you just taught us today. Yep. Paddle, hop up, some slow air squats to flush it out, right? Am I right? They, they, right. They could. Do, absolutely. They could do a paddling routine. So I would, I went with them, ski erg, right. Right. right? There's your paddle. Yep. And then what I want you to do is you're going to go and, and do a lunge, like because they're always split. Right. right. So we'll do a recovery lunge, or we're going to do a high intensity kicking set, you know, for the boogie board. Instead of surfing, you're going to use a board, high intensity into a very easy recovery build the capacity of that specific movement pattern because you'll see surfers lightly kick their right. feet. But that's what we are. We're experts in it. And so anybody, it doesn't matter who you are. You could walk into a gym. I need to assess you. I need to assess you because I need you to take some ownership in this relationship. That's what I need. And number two is, is that I need to look at the movements that are the highest value of your time. What are they? because we don't have unlimited time. Mm -hmm. And you know what, if I focus on the wrong thing, it will make your fitness worse. If Rich Froning, for example, just focused on running sprinting when we started working together in 2014, then you know what it would have done for his endurance? Nothing. 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 It would have made his rate of fatigue even worse because his speed would have been the stimulus and that would have been the adaptation. And so his percentage wouldn't have been 28.7. It would have shot, you know, much He'd higher than that. Bailey. <laughs> there you go. No. So two two endurance assessments. So if you're gonna if you were gonna try to help create a protocol for when a box owner brings an athlete in, what 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 would be kind of some standard assessments you would do you would you would think would be like obviously there's no perfect scenario, but like what would be two, one to two things that you would have you test a new athlete every time they come in the gym with regard to this modality. So I would give athletes that came in the option and saying, here's, you know what, an assessment tool. And okay. if you want to do it, but they, there's no reason why they can't ultimately build that into test week, meaning we're right. going to test for one minute on the rower and six minutes. And now you could do okay. an assessment just that based upon the rower. That is what you're looking for, the right. fall off. Right, the right. rate of fatigue. And, yep. and I'll give you that one so you can give it to the people that listen and okay. they can apply that. Awesome. That the tool will also tell them their their easy pace, their lactate threshold, and their VO2 pace. So we'll give in the row and the run if they wanted to do a 400 run and a mile run. They'll both be doing that for them. So that's number one. I would make that available. Right. You want them aware of what their strengths and weaknesses are. And so that tool is helpful. But the other is something that's more subjective. Right. So like what I just did with you guys in the clean, I asked you, is it your strength or is it your recovery? Right. I don't care what it is. I just need you to take some ownership in right. it. And so let's just say that you did this workout with me today and then you come back a week later and I say, hey, if you did this workout last week 
and you worked on recovery, what I want you to do is pick something heavier on the mm. recovery side because you're going to stick with the recovery. And if you did strength side, you're going to pick something heavier over here. If you haven't done it, we're gonna, you're going to do it like they did last week. Right. Time domains are the same. So let's just say that you say next week, hey, man, I don't want to work on the recovery. I want to do the intensity side. Mm. Does it matter? Of course it doesn't because you picked. Right. We're trying to get athletes to take some responsibility. Yeah. That's what we're ultimately trying to do is take responsibility over the direction that they picked. Mm -hmm. Because too many times the coach is blamed. And why on earth would a coach even know if you were competent in this or not? Right. Like how would I know if we go down there and you do something that I know you did good? Mm -hmm. I have no idea if you worked hard, did it. Right. I don't. It's relative. Yeah. Right. But I don't know. But if you fail and you pick, then you don't blame me. What you do is you blame yourself and you think about it on the way home. And if you're thinking about it on the way home, that means that you'll come back and want to fix it tomorrow. That's retention. Yeah. I need you to take that ownership of the wins and the losses. That's why I never say I was the one that helped, you know, made that person win. Right. It's I, I didn't. I was one of the people that made that possible for them. Mm -hmm. But it's their win. Right. They own it. They they did it. Right. And and it's theirs exclusively to keep. A coach that takes that credibility, that, 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 that I don't think that's cool. It is the athlete's win, and yeah. that's theirs. Because yeah. that athlete, you know what? They're the ones that did all the work. It's the same thing that, you know, if you work for a private company and your boss, who you may hate, but he's hired a bunch of very smart people to run the business so that he could stay in Tahiti, you know, you know, 12 months out of the year. You may be bitter, but the fact is, is that boss was smart to hire right. smart people. Right. And that's how I feel about the athletes that win. It's like, you know what? They put in the work and right. they arranged their own people right. so that they can make that win occur. Right. And what you're doing is undermining that. That was their choice to bring me on board. Yeah. They took that risk. Yeah. I, and I, I Especially think, back in the day, the Kalipas, the Neils. Right. Um, the, well, look at Rich. You know, Frazier, one of the things that I said early on was I was really nervous and working with him. We met in January of 2015, and I said, are, are you worried about losing your strength? And this is the difference between a champion and someone who claims that they want to win. There's a big difference. And, I mean, if you're listening to it, you want to know the difference. Are you the one that, that will blame a coach for knocking you off the podium, knocking you out of the top 10, you know, not qualifying for the games? Or do you take that responsibility? Mm -hmm. And what you realize that if, if you don't take that risk, that you will never get better. You will always finish exactly where you did the year before because you're doing what everybody else is doing. Right. And that was the thing that Matt Frazier said was, I never want to finish second again, mm -hmm. ever. And if this knocks me out of the sport, that's fine because you know what I want? I want to win. I want to win. And there's nothing wrong if an athlete says, I want to, you know, top 10. I just want to go. That's fine. But don't tell me you want to win, yet you don't want to take the risk to do the things it takes to win. Right. And that's where I have a disconnect. Mm -hmm. But the Fronings, the Fra I mean, all of those champions, that's the thing they had in common. I want to do the extraordinary. That's the difference. Great risk, great rewards. Yeah. I, th I think one thing about you is, if we take it a little off topic, yeah. you've been, you're, 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 not your personal life, but you're just this running guy, coach. People don't know you. <laughs> Tell, I want to ask you a couple of personal questions. All right, go ahead. In your car, you get in the car right now, what's on the radio? Or what CD, what tape, what Spotify playlist you listening to? So I had the killers, Mr. Brightside was playing, coming in here. Classic. Yeah, Vegas. I'm going to the show in August, I so think. You're Vegas. a big killers fan. Well, I mean, I like, I mean, just because I know they were from Vegas and why not travel to Vegas to see the killers? And it's Vegas. What other, what will you be doing in Vegas? What is a weekend? Yeah, and I assume you're bringing Mrs. Hinshaw? Yeah, so no. You, how bring, long have you been married? 12. Also, no. 12 years. It's your sure. second marriage? Yeah. Okay. Second. Sure. Personal. Three kids. <laughs> Three kids. Uh, no, I love Vegas. I, um, Did you be good, do you get crazy in Vegas? Is it a, what happens in Vegas for Chris stays in Vegas? Pretty much. Are you guys <laughs> placing Are you guys placing over-under bets on handstand holds when you go there? <laughs> no, it's gotten a little more involved than that. <laughs> it's gotten a little more involved than that. Well, no, I really enjoy Vegas. So we're, we're going to Vegas actually um, the end of 
end of May. Um, it's my um, two daughters, their boyfriend, one's fiance, and and Heidi and myself. So there's six of us, and oh, full you know, we'll family stay, trip. Yeah, we'll stay in a hotel, a nice hotel. We'll see. Um, oh, um, we'll have nice dinners there. Oh, is Cirque du Soleil? Cirque du Soleil. Yeah. I mean, so I like. I really enjoy. You know, I said it earlier, family and friends and your health. I really enjoy being around my kids now. And I like their boyfriends. I like how nice they are They're to adult them. They're kids. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, 20, 28 and 30. Wow. Um, yeah, good careers. Good. Yeah, just good kids. And, and so I like spending time with them. I, 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 it's, it's, it's interesting how, as a parent, things get dramatically better. I hope so. I have a 14 month old, so I'm looking forward <laughs> oh, to it. Oh, bro, you would only, you're not even close. Oh. I'm not even going to talk to you because you're so far away. You yeah. might kill yourself 10 times until that happens. Do, do your, what do your kids think about you? Are they, because you are a big deal. You know, you're famous and, you know, as small a pond as CrossFit is, but you're very well recognized, very well respected. What do the kids make of like dad kind of gaining this notoriety and fame later in life? I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I mean, if they've talked about it, I don't remember. I, those, I really like to just be a good role model to them. And, and I don't, you know, it's interesting that when they're young and you reflect on how you were as a parent and you could always reflect back and say you, you can be better, you could be different. But the question was, is were you present? Were you available to them? And that's what I always try and be. And, and there, you know, I raised my, my daughters by themselves and, and by myself. And, and that was a very, really difficult for me um, because I don't understand what it's like to be a teenage girl. I don't know. I could tell you it's hard. <laughs> so, so that's where it was like it was, it, was a, 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 it was exhausting for me. But what I always wanted is, is I wanted in the areas that I was, I was skilled at. And as they got older and started to look at college and, and opportunity and, and what to do with life, and especially with their career and jobs and interviews, that's where I can really shine as a dad. And I, I, I think that they're seeing that value. And, and not that my effort was ever any different. It was just the quality of the work that I was able to, advice that I was able to give them is, 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 is better. Um, and it was mostly because, you know, if you if you were my 14 year old daughter and you came in and you're yelling and crying because I ruined your underwear, I don't know what that even means as a dad. I don't know how I could ruin underwear by putting it in the wash. You're like I'm not even comprehending what you're telling me right now. <laughs> right, but if you ask me about how to write a resume or how to answer questions, you know, in a promotion, I could do that because I work sales in you know 20 plus years in Silicon Valley at you know the highest level, and so those are the things that that. Uh, for me, I, I like now, um, you know, the kids and I, um, we all went to the Narrows and we, we went up the Narrows in Utah uh, last summer. Epic. One of the coolest things I've ever done. And it was not only the adventure, but it was because I was able to, to, to have that much time with them. And so, yeah, it's interesting being older and them being older that the relationship changes and it's in a spot now where... Yeah, I just, like, they're always on my mind. Like, last night, I, you know, I found this incredible source for fresh turmeric out of Hawaii, and I ordered my kids four pounds of it, you know? So, do they know about this? Like, are they going to show up the door? I, Dad, to, I told yeah. them that. You're going to have yellow teeth for a year. I told my, I told my. No inflammation, but your teeth will be yellow. I told my daughter, and she's like, I, I said, I, I sent you four pounds of, of turmeric. It's going to arrive on the 27th. And, and they're like, oh, thanks, Dad. You know, like. But I'm not doing it for the thanks. I want right. them to know I'm thinking of you. And, right. and it was like a cool thing. And they got a juicer that they could press it into anyway. So, Well, I, I think all of that comes across not only just from hearing those stories, but like from your interaction with the CrossFit community, your willingness to interact and educate coaches. Um, and I'm just on a personal note, really happy to see SMEs back. Really happy big to see time. big to you guys back in the mix. And uh, I'm yeah, looking forward too. to... I'm pumped about that. Yeah, I'm looking forward to... I mean, there's a, we've been doing this we'll for two hours. One. We got to have one. We've been doing here. this for two hours. There's, oh, there's, there's, I gotta, there's a tremendous amount. Yeah. We, I was trying lot. to talk. Yeah, you, I was trying to talk. This is his trick. This is I'm his excited. trick. This is but trick. we got to hit one of those up. There's going to be some links in the show. Yep. Um, is, 
the Mama Henshaw handstand program going to be something yeah, that yeah. we Yeah, how do I beat my grandma in a handstand? Program? Yeah, I want to. <laughs> no. Uh, no. No, no, no handstand no, program. No, no. But we'll get the firefighting program out there. We'll get the ratios out yep. there. Yep. And that'll be some great stuff for the listeners. And I think yep. we'll oh, link yeah. out to the uh, registration for all the SME courses and all that stuff. But I think, uh, yeah, all yeah, 50, it's just, all 50 yeah, of them all 50 happening of them in the next, Chris is rocking up to this in year. The next <laughs> 20 weeks. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, but no, as a uh, personal from us to you, thank you for what oh, you do in the you. community, the, the education, the knowledge, the awareness that you've brought to the community, I think has had a, a, a really significant impact. And I'm, I, and I, don't think that's going to stop. So thank you. Thank you, man. And thank, uh, you. thank you for meeting that. with us. And uh, yeah, yeah looking forward it. to it. Yeah, let's go let's, run. Let's go run. What a great dude. Thank you, Chris, for coming on the show. We appreciate it. I learned so much from interviewing you and chatting with you. And I hope you guys that listened got the same benefit from listening to Chris Hinshaw. Again, if you haven't already, check out the Aerobic Capacity course. This Friday, part two of dropping in. You're going to learn even more. Like I said, this guy just loves it. He's a CrossFitter through and through. True to the CrossFit spirit, he gives away everything for free, but there's always so much more you can learn from him. So tune in this Friday to part two of our dropping in with Chris Henshaw. Thanks for listening to this episode, and we want to thank our partner and sponsor, O2. If you're an affiliate owner and have questions about carrying O2 in your facility or interested in a free refrigerator, go to wholesale.drinko2.com forward slash pages forward slash best dash hour dash offer for more details. Thanks for checking out this episode of the Best Hour of Their Day podcast. We appreciate you listening and choosing to have us help you and your passion for coaching and affiliate ownership. You can find more episodes just like this on all podcast platforms. If you're interested in learning more, you can reach out to us on any social media platforms, or you can visit www.besthouroftheirday.com to book a call. If you found this episode helpful for you, please share it so that we can help other coaches and affiliate owners to help build a bigger and stronger CrossFit community. Thanks for listening.